Well, good morning. It's good to see you all again here on this Monday for lectures. Uh, this first lecture comes straight out of section 2.3, which has the longest title out of any section I think I've ever seen. Getting information from a graph of a function. Um, there's lots of information we're going to be able to obtain from the graphs of functions, which we'll go through here in just a minute. Um, but again, this is all dependent, just like last time, on your possession of the graph or your ability to make the graph very accurately. So if, if you don't have the graph, if you can't make it, none of these techniques are going to be applicable. You'll have to use other methods. So let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing that we're going to look at is finding the domain of a function. The domain, as you know, is the allowed input or output excuse me, the allowed inputs. So all the real numbers that are allowed to be plugged in. So let me just give you some random graph of a function. I'm going to have sort of a curvy graph starting there and ending there. And it's going to jump down here a little bit over and then it's, that's a filled in circle, a little over and then rise back up. And then it's going to have a single point sort of sitting alone by itself over there. So if you're remembering everything there is to remember about these graphs, we've got an x-axis and a y-axis. And the, the x-axis represents our inputs. And the y-axis tells us the heights or the values associated with that x input below it. And that's exactly how we're going to find the domain. We're going to go from point to point on this graph, and we're just going to drop an imaginary line down to the input that created that point. So this point here, we're going to drop a straight line down. And we know that that x input created that point above it. And we do this for every single point on the graph. That point was created comes from that point there. This point comes from this input here. We just keep doing this over and over again. And there's some patterns that you'll notice. Like for example, I did not need to do this one. Because we have a continuous graph in between there. In between this left side and this right side. So all of the inputs for the points in between those parts of the graph come from the x-axis in between the, the inputs for the endpoints. Right, so this, this simplifies this process quite a bit. We can just erase all those lines and we really only need to concern ourselves with the ends of sections of our graph. So I know this is part of my domain, this was part of my domain, and then this singleton point here just has that one, that single point. So if I erase all of my imaginary lines now, we can see our domain. Our domain is highlighted here on the x-axis in red. These are the inputs which gave us the graph above. Now why not these points in between? Why not the points to the extremes? Because the graph shows you everything that comes out of your inputs. There's nothing that comes out of the inputs that I highlighted there. There's nothing graphed in this column There's nothing graphed in this column. There's nothing graphed in this column or this one. There's nothing over there. So your graph, your function, doesn't have anything to say for those inputs below. It has nothing, no rule, no link. If you were to try and plug something in in those intervals, the this function wouldn't know what to do with it, which means those values are not allowed. 
Those are not allowed inputs, if you will. So they are not in the domain. So I'll try my best to erase most of this. And then we'll write down in interval notation what our domain is. So when you write down domains, usually you have x values, right? I'm just going to list mine out. A first x value, a second x value, a third x value, a fourth x value, and a fifth x value there. And I'm just going to write this domain in interval notation. So we've got the interval from x1 to x2, and we've got the interval from x3 to x4, and we've got the interval from, oh wait, that last one isn't an interval, it's just a single point. So we've got just this, okay? And this is our domain, I'll just call it D, and that's it, okay? And that's how you can find the domain of any graph of a function. Another thing that we can learn from the graphs of functions is the range. And I will go ahead and draw a new graph um, for this one. The range of a function. This is the set of possible outputs. So the graph I had before work, would have worked fine, but I'll give you a little bit of a cleaner one. So this one's going to start down here. It's going to come up, come down, and then go back up again like this, and then eventually drop down to this point here. So we could identify, instead of all the allowed inputs for this function, we could identify all the possible outputs. This is exactly the idea of identifying the heights, all the possible heights, whether or not they overlap with each other. So instead of dropping down to the x-axis, we're going to drop over, drop over to the y-axis. So we, from point to point, just create an imaginary line over to the y-axis, horizontal line over to the y-axis, and we do this for every single point. There are more important points than others, for example, this point may not seem as important because there's two lines which go over to that height. It may not see as, seem as important to this height right here, this point. Right? So we get all of these lines that go over to our y-axis and we see this set of possible heights, which I've just illustrated here. So I'll erase those imaginary lines, and we've got our range. Every height for this function is in between these two heights. So this is our range. And I'll go ahead and give these values. This will be our first y value, our second y value. Our range is equal to this interval on the y-axis of y1 up to y2. So domain, we're looking at the x values which give us the function heights. In the range, we're looking at the heights. Right, right? We're looking at all those heights. We're saying, what's the smallest of them? What's the biggest of them? Are there any gaps in there? For example, I didn't draw this to begin with, but maybe I should have. What if our function you know, ends here, and then it jumps down a little bit and continues a little bit? Well, then we need to include this interval here, y3 and y4. We need to include that. in our range intervals, right? So we try to include all those intervals in the y-axis, which include heights of our function, just like we did for the domain and the x-values, but now we're doing it 
with respect to the y values. Okay. The next thing is from this section is actually something that we've done over and over again, and so I'm not going to do it again. Um, it's comparing function values and solving equalities and inequalities from graphs of functions. We've done that. We've, we did that last section, I think. So if you want more on that, go back and watch that movie on solving inequalities and equalities graphically. Okay. Um, the next thing, though, is looking at where a graph is increasing or decreasing. So a graph or function, or you could say any rule, is increasing on an interval a to b. So these are x values, a to b. It's an interval. Is increasing on an interval a to b if you plug in something x1 and it's less than when you plug in something else whenever x1 is less than x2. So your graph is increasing if you plug in a small number and you plug in a big number and the bigger number gives you a bigger output. It gives you a bigger result than the smaller input. Graphically, what does that look like? Well, you take any graph of a function, so this is f. I'm going to take this interval here, a to b. And notice what happens. If, if I pick x1 and x2, no matter which x1 and x2 I pick from this interval a to b, if I pick x1 smaller than x2, then what we have is this height is, is less than this height. Right? This is f of x1. This is f of x2. We notice that. Um, and my grammar perhaps here is incorrect. Um, um, if, whenever, x1 is less than x2, then this happens. Okay, So we, we pick any two inputs, and we get this outcome that the smaller input gives a smaller output than the bigger input. And graphically, it's rather obvious. Wherever it's sloping upwards, we have an increasing graph. So we don't need to rely so much on this definition when we've just got um, when we've got uh, the graph. I'll go ahead and erase what I've drawn here. And I'm going to highlight in green the increasing parts of this graph. So it looks like our graph starts off increasing and then it stops increasing at the top of that little hill. And then it goes down that hill, and it starts getting bigger again from the bottom. And it's growing all the way up. So this is the increasing part. So the next part is decreasing. A graph or a function is decreasing on some interval a to b, if whenever x1 is less than x2, then this holds. The smaller input gives a bigger output than the big input does. So we see it right in here. If I pick something here and here, x1, x2, it's true that x1 is less than x2. It's also true that f of x1 is bigger than f of x2.
right? It's higher up. So we just reverse the inequality and we've got ourselves the result. So we can graphically see this, right? We don't need this definition to, um, to really show us that. It's seen right here. Our graph is falling. It's getting smaller along that purple interval, along that purple portion. So we see that there's some x inputs, x1, x2. We notice that for any numbers in here, for any pair of numbers in here, our graph is increasing. Right, our graph is increasing for any input in there. And for here, our graph is increasing. So when we talk about where a graph is increasing, we usually talk about the domain intervals where it is increasing. So that means we're talking about these intervals down here. It's increasing from negative infinity up to x1 where it stops increasing and it starts decreasing. But then it begins increasing again from x2 for the rest of the graph. And our graph is decreasing on the interval of x1 to x2. Okay. Now there's this question of what's it doing at x1 and at x2. Well, our graph levels out. It's neither increasing nor decreasing. And these are what we call local or global maximums or minimums. We call them in general extrema. It's where our graph takes extreme values. And that's the next thing for us to talk about. Local, global, extrema. Now, how to find local and global extrema is largely a topic for a calculus course where you know something about the derivative of a function, which means you know a function to describe the slope anywhere of your function. Um, but this is a pre-calculus pre course, so we're going to we're going to stick to just graphically identifying these things. And it's not too bad. It's really not too bad. So there's two different flavors of extrema. Uh, the first is a maximum. The second is a minimum. And these two words are associated with the heights of our function. So we're talking about a maximum height and a minimum height. So if I have a graph here, and I just give it a little wiggle there in the middle and there, and then go up, and let's say this is the end point here, and this is the end point here, I can identify all the maximum values. I'll highlight them in green. Um, it looks like we've got a local maximum here. We have a local maximum here. And we have a both local and global maximum there. Perhaps I'm covering that up. There we go. Okay, these ones I said the word local. Before I said max. And the reason I said local is because if we just if we notice those maximums they're taken at these x values, I'll say x1, x2. When we plug in x1, we get this height up here. And if I take a little little interval around x1, this, this point at x1, that's the tallest piece in that little neighborhood. It's the tallest piece. It's the biggest fish in the pond, right? Um, same thing for x2. If, if I plug in x2, I get this point here. And if I look just around x2, just a little bit around x2, nothing is taller nearby. Now if I make that little interval big, like really big, well then obviously there's going to be bigger things around, but it doesn't change the fact but that if there's a small, small pond around x2, a small, small neighborhood around x2, that that height, which looks like something like this perhaps, 
that this height is that local max at x2. And I didn't do this before, but at x1, maybe we can call that y1. So y1 is a local max at x1. y2 is a local max at x2. But then we've got this, this beast over here on the far right. right. We plug in this number, x3, and we get this height up here. And it's bigger than everything, right? It, there's n there's nothing around it. There's nothing anywhere on this graph that is taller than that point. That's what we call a global max. Okay, you've, to identify something as a global maximum, all you need to make sure is that no, no other point on that entire functions graph has that height. Okay, now you could have multiple, uh, multiple inputs that give the same global maximum. You could have a graph that looks something like this, repeats over and over again, and there's lots of these inputs that give you the same maximum height. So you could have several global maxima, whatever those x values are. Okay. But something's a global max if it reaches that ultimate height for the function. Now the next thing is these local and global minima. So I'll highlight these in blue. And then I'll use the same words to describe them. So we've got this one down here, which is a minimum. We've got this one here, which is a minimum. And right next to this maximum, we've got a minimum. Two of these are local. This one and this one. When we plug in, I'm going to use different letters here, A1, we get this minimum height here of B1. I don't know what that is. Some number. This is a local minimum because if we look close to A1, we don't get anything smaller. And over here, if we plug in A2, we get this height here, which is really close to this maximum, right? It's getting a little confusing in here, but maybe I'll just call this one B2. I'll write it as nicely as possible, though it's getting confusing. So we have local, we have local minima at A1 and at A2, and their respective heights are B1 and B2. But there's one of these that is a global minimum, and that's this one. If I plug in little m, I get this height here, which is smaller than every other height on the graph. So we say that this is a global minimum. OK. You can have multiple global minima. Just like the graph I showed you before, that wave that oscillates back and forth, you can have lots of points which give you the same global minimum value. Okay, it doesn't necessarily have to be unique. Um, and I think that's it. That's it for this section. So we talked about um, several properties of graphs that were familiar to us, and then a couple more that were new. We talked about how to find the domain and how to find the range of a graph, a function of a graph. We talked about how to find the um, the increasing and decreasing portions of a graph and how to describe them in terms of the intervals of the domain where they're increasing or decreasing. And then we ended this whole talk with a discussion of talking about the biggest pieces or the smallest pieces of a graph in terms of the words maxima and minima, which are both just examples of extrema, the extreme values of our graph. Uh, I hope that helps with their homework. We didn't have many concrete examples there, but again, all this depends on is you having a function graph or being able to make one. So for any problem you come up with, just make that graph and then use these properties to determine these, these characteristics of your graph. And I'll see you next time for a lecture on 
2.6, something like this. We're, we're going to skip a couple sections here, I think. So until next time, I'll see you later.